I've just been challenged by fellow YouTubers, Ginny and Davis. Who are these YouTubers and why are they challenging me? Ginny and Davis are the owners of Samara Table Company and they build high quality furniture that's best used where people gather. They may be best known for crafting some of the finest cutting and charcuterie boards that money can buy. But back to this challenge, they are challenging their community of followers in the first ever Samara Table Company box o scrap challenge and one lucky winner is going to win a 250 dollars gift card yeah you know what challenge accepted oh my gosh this is pretty serious what am i gonna do i think i just need to order a box of scraps on their website and see what happens box from Samara Table Company has made it to the shop. I have no idea what's going to be in here. Let's find out together. And here's what's in the box. I even got my very own Ginny and Davis sticker. That'll go on the wall back there somewhere. So first of all, nice piece of walnut. Ooh, this one's cool. It's got like a live edge to it here. Some really beautiful walnut here. All right, so that's what was in the box. I'm actually super duper impressed. This is a lot of great wood. Now I need to figure out what I'm gonna make with all of this. I want whatever I make to be reflective of the Samara Table Company brand. Maybe some sort of household good. Maybe something that can bring people together. I've had some time to think about this and my first thought was to make another walnut and epoxy chessboard. But you know, I really wanna try something new. But I will leave a link for that video down below if you wanna watch it next. Then I thought about making some sort of knife holder to go along with the cutting board theme. Or maybe some sort of candle holder since Ginny and Davis just launched a new line of candles. But after seeing all of this beautiful walnut, I knew I had to come up with something else, and I was really struggling. Then it hit me. While I was reviewing a long list of projects I'd like to make someday, a Jenga set. Nothing brings people together like a fun game of Jenga. But there's just one problem. A Jenga set with 54 blocks needs 13 and a half linear feet of one inch material to complete a full set. And I don't just want to make the blocks, I'd like to make a holder for it too. However, after doing some calculations, I think I can get a full set of Jenga blocks and a holder out of this box of scraps if I can get a little bit creative and figure out a way to make this material stretch as far as possible. The solution is to add some colored epoxy reflective of the Jenny and Davis logo to some of these blocks to make it go a little bit further. Let's get to work. First, I need to make a mold to hold the epoxy and walnut scraps. I use melamine to make my molds. I take a few quick measurements and cut some parts down to size. I cut the sides of this mold to one and a half inches in width. Once I have all the pieces cut to size, I like to attach the sides of the mold to the top of the bottom of the mold. I'll attach each side using some Alex Fast Drying Caulk and a few one and a half inch 18 gauge brad nails that I'll nail through the bottom. This makes things easier to take apart later. This is also much faster and cheaper than pre-drilling a bunch of holes and using screws. I don't skimp out on the caulk either. I caulk in between the bottom of each side and the base of the mold, along all the seams on the inside of the mold, and for extra insurance, I like to put a little on the outside of the mold as well. Next, I just let this stuff cure for three to four hours or overnight. Now, I know it says you can paint this stuff in 20 minutes, but if you rush it, there is a much higher chance that leaks will develop. Epoxy will stick to melamine. I repeat, epoxy sticks to melamine really, really well. And I personally hate using tape, and I find it much easier to use mold release instead. I will leave a link down below if you want to grab some of this stuff for yourself. When I can, I like to spray this stuff outside. The one downside is that it is an aerosol. If you're spraying this stuff in your shop, make sure to cover your wood or move it to another room, because if your wood gets some of this overspray on it, the epoxy might not stick to it. I like to spray this stuff in the mold, let it set for five minutes, and buff it in with a shop rag. Then, for for extra insurance, I apply a second coat the exact same way. I want to end up with a nice mix of Jenga blocks with and without epoxy. So while the mold release dries for a few minutes, I'm sorting out the scraps between the ones that will get epoxy and the ones that won't. The ones going into the epoxy get a little cleanup too. Next, I cut as much good material off the scraps that will go into the mold. These cutoffs will be added to the pile of scraps that won't get epoxy. Now I can arrange the scraps of walnut in the mold. By the way, 
Wood floats really well in epoxy. I just added some packing tape to some scraps of wood so the epoxy won't stick to them. Then I clamp everything down in place. The last thing I do before any pour is double check that the mold is level in both directions. This is critical for larger pours. If the mold isn't level, the epoxy will flow all to one side and you may end up needing to pour more epoxy than you expected. And that is expensive. Finally, we can mix some epoxy. I'm using super clear liquid glass thick pour for this project. This is my go-to for all my deep pours and I love it. And to measure smaller pours, I like to use these pre-marked containers. One thing to note, this stuff doesn't set up for three or four days, so take a lot of time mixing it. Undermixed epoxy is one of the only things that cannot be fixed in an epoxy project. Also make sure to scrape the sides and the bottom really good while mixing. Also, don't add any dyes or pigments before the epoxy is thoroughly mixed. Once it has been mixed for an absurdly long time, then add your choice of color. I'm using this black diamond powder to make colors that are close to the colors in the Genie and Davis logo. Then I keep on mixing. While I'm doing that, if you're enjoying the content or learning something new, I would appreciate if you would subscribe down below so I know that I should keep making content like this for you. Thank you for your support. Now, a lot of people seem surprised that I don't use a vacuum chamber before I pour, but uh, too cheap to buy one. But I do let my epoxy rest for 10 to 15 minutes in the container before I pour it. Then I torch it. This gets rid of 90% of the trap bubbles created during the mixing process. Now we can finally pour. I will start by pouring each color in the mold on opposite sides in hopes that they find a beautiful bliss right in the middle. In all seriousness, here is some expert level advice. If you want to swirl a design into your epoxy, wait until the epoxy is the consistency of honey or slightly thicker. If you swirl before that, the pattern won't stick. One other mistake I see all the time is that people will scrape the sides of the container to get every last drop of epoxy into their pour. Please stop it. If there's any unmixed epoxy in the container, it is likely to be stuck to the sides. Wasting a few drops in your container is far better than wasting an entire project due to some uncured epoxy. Now I just babysit for the next few hours. I check for leaks and pop all the air bubbles that arise with a blowtorch. The next part is boring. We just wait four or five days for the epoxy to cure hard enough to finish it. Epoxy will continue to harden a little more each day for several weeks. So the longer you can wait to let it cure, the easier it will be to sand and finish it. For my larger projects, this can be 30 plus days. While that cures, I decided to get one side of the non-epoxy scraps jointed. I'll wait until the epoxy cures to plain everything down to a final thickness. Fast forward a few days using the power of YouTube and we can get this thing out of the mold. Here, I'm just doing a light sanding on the bottom of the epoxy chunk because the mold release is so slick that the planar rollers will slip as it's going through if I don't do this. Finally, I can get everything planed down to a final thickness of three quarters of an inch. Also, I figured it would be easier to plane this entire chunk of epoxy down to thickness first, then cut all the strips to width at the same time. Now it's back to the jointer to get one straight edge on all these pieces before ripping them down on the table saw. I took just a second to mark each edge that I was jointing, just so I wouldn't forget to run the same edge along my table saw fence when I cut the strips to width. Now this is where future Ben could have told current Ben not to cut it down at all and just make this thing into a charcuterie board. But no, why would he do that? Instead, current Ben rips everything down to a width of one and one thirty second of an inch on the table saw. Uh, but wait, that's plywood, not walnut. I know that. I'm cutting some extra scrap pieces to use for test cuts later. See, here is the wall walnut. No need to overreact. After running everything through the table saw, there were a few rough areas and spots that needed to be addressed. I decided to clamp all the strips together on edge and sand them down with some 80 grit sandpaper. Now, if you know me, the last thing I like to do is measure. So instead of measuring, I can take three pieces of that scrap I ripped down, put their widths together to figure out the exact length I need to cut each block down to. Then I can set my stop block up to that length on my cross cut sled and cut 54 blocks to the perfect length. This should give me a perfect square when everything is stacked up in rows of three. These look great, but now I need to make a holder. The holder will have two sides and a base. There's just one problem. 
One of the scraps I need to use has this curvy edge on it and I don't want to cut off the live edge because it will give the holder a little character. I decided to tape this bad boy down to a piece of plywood using the blue tape and CA glue trick. Then I ran it through my table saw to make that curvy edge perfectly straight. Now I have two pieces I can use for the sides of my holder. What? You can't hear me? Take your ear protection off, gosh. I said you now have two pieces you can use for the sides of your holder. You're welcome. Next I plane down the sides to one and a half inches in thickness. Just look how happy that guy still is. He has no idea how much Standing is in his future. Poor guy. Now I need to determine how tall the holder is going to be and again, I'm not about to measure anything. So I just start stacking up my Jenga blocks and also took into account the thickness of the base piece. Now I can just make some marks and cut everything down to length on my miter saw. I will save this little cutoff to create the bottom of the holder later. I thought it'd be a good idea to do a miter in the corner of this holder. To do this, I set my table saw to 45 degrees. Now to set the table saw fence, I took a couple of my Jenga blocks and used them as a gauge. I'm going to leave the first cut just a little bit long. Also, just so I remember which way I want the miter to slant, I mark the end of each of the side piece for reference. After the first cut, I can make some miter micro adjustments to my saw finch and sneak up on my final cut until everything fits perfectly. Now I just glue this contraption up. I taped the miter edges together with some blue tape, flipped it over, spread some tight bond 2 on each edge, spread it around with my trusty finger, and folded this thing in half. Then I added a couple of these right angle clamps, which have a link down below if you want some by the way, to hold everything in place while the glue dries. This couldn't have gone any better. Just look how happy this guy is. He has no idea how much sanding's in his future. Oh well, moving on. Now I want to finish off the corner of this holder with some splines. I cut the slots for each spline on my table saw using the spline cutting jig thingy I made. Next, I plane down some of the lighter walnut from the box of scraps to make the splines. Now my planer wouldn't go low enough to get the strips as thin as I needed, so I used some more blue tape and CEA glue to attach the walnut strip to a piece of plywood to make it thick enough to trick my planer. This thing went full send through my planer until it was the perfect thickness. The splines get chopped down into smaller bits and then they're glued in place and set aside to dry while I cut the base for the holder. The base is going to be simple. I took the cutoff we saved from our side, cut it down to size, and glued it in place leaving the knot facing out to add some character. A few clamps will hold it in place after I make sure it is perfectly square. And just like that the splines are dry. I can trim them down with a flush cut saw and give them a quick sanding to get them perfectly smooth. Oh yeah that looks nice. And this is where past Ben is laughing at current Ben. Because now current Ben gets to sand all these blocks for the next few hours. Yeah, I should have just made a charcuterie board. You see, each block has six edges. That's 324 total freaking edges. And each freaking edge is sanded with three freaking grits of sandpaper. That's a grand total of 972 little edges to sand. And that isn't including the holder. I also knocked down each corner and edge edge just a little with a 220 grit sandpaper. And now for the moment we've all been waiting for, or at least the moment I've been waiting for for hours now. That's right, it's finish time. I am finishing this product with the Black Forest Monocoat Furniture Oil. I have done reviews on this product in the past and there are links to the videos down below. But basically to apply this stuff you just buff it on with a white buffing pad and wipe off all the extra with a shop rag until it feels dry. It's pretty darn easy and a little goes a long way with this stuff. One thing that did help me speed things along was batching each step of the finishing process. I put oil on 10 or 12 blocks at a time, then wiped them all down at the same time with a shop rag. Either way, this also seemed to take an eternity. That's it, the last piece. My hands are killing me. One of my favorite things to do on a project like this is add these little felt feet. It's like putting icing on the cake. One thing to note if you're going to make something like this for yourself, the epoxy adds a lot of noticeable weight over just the wooden pieces. I'm really looking forward to see how I can use this information against unsuspecting opponents. I just want to take another second to thank Ginny and Davis one more time for putting this challenge together. If it wasn't for them in this challenge, I'm not sure I would have ever marked an epoxy and walnut Jenga set off of my wish list. And to top it off, I still have some more great scraps that I can use for something else. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then go ahead and click this video on the screen right here. The YouTube algorithm's convinced you're going to love this video as much as you love this one, and it might actually know you better than you know yourself. 
I know, right? Thanks for watching. See you next time.